Good evening, members of Liberty.me, and wel welcome to our, our uh, weekly broadcast, a discussion about books. I'm especially pleased to be here tonight because we get to talk about Frank Chodorov's amazing 1956 book called The Rise and uh, Fall of Society, which uh, to me is one of the great books ever written. Members of Liberty.me, and wel welcome to our, our uh, weekly... Whoops. Sorry, I hadn't realized that I left that thing on. Excuse me, just one second. It's strange to hear a sudden echo of yourself. And a reminder that uh, Google Google uh, Hangouts is actually works on a delay on these live broadcasts, so, which is interesting. In any case, to make sure I suppose that I don't say anything terribly ob objectionable before broadcasting to uh, uh, the billions. In any case, uh, so yeah, we're talking about Frank Chodorak's Rise and Fall of Society tonight, and I just adore this book. I just, I mean, like overall, I think it's the best go-to book on economics and politics uh, for the average person. Uh, by the way, I hate that phrase for the average person, as if uh, you know, there's there's people out there that have too rarefied a skill to be exposed to. You know, truth. It's it's just such a such a dumb thing. I don't even like the phrase beginner, intermediate, advanced. I think all that's just it's just nonsense. I mean, the most advanced thinkers I I know could use a good schooling in this book. I mean, there's not a single uh, professor at Harvard Harvard University's uh, political science department or Oxford, or Cambridge, or anywhere else that couldn't benefit from reading this book. I mean, there's just so much fabulous truth in it. And he drives home the point. And it's not just about Frank Chodorov, although he was an amazing man, basically a contemporary of of Mises and Hayek's and Hazlitt's and that whole generation. I mean, they're all born the last, you know, 10, 15 years of the 19th century and all died, you know, um, in the uh, in the 60s, 70s and, and, and 80s. Just the most amazing generation of thinkers I can possibly imagine. And they left us such an amazing literary output, just so extraordinary. And I think this ranks really up at the top. Now, it's a little strange. Like, why haven't you ever heard of this book, Rise and Fall of Society by Frank Chodorov? I mean, it's actually remarkable how few people really uh, read this book. They didn't get a big exposure when it was written. I'm not even sure there were that many copies printed. It was written at the end of his life. Frank Chodorov had already become a kind of, I don't know, how do you say, like non-person, you know? Uh, uh, the, the basically what happened is the liberal libertarianism as we knew it in the interwar period got destroyed um, during the war and after and that whole generation of thinkers just got kind of wiped out and replaced with with this new breed of of people that that supposedly uh, replaced them um, and incorporated their interests and concerns for reducing government and and that sort of thing and they were called this new nom nomenclature uh, conservative, you know, they were the conservatives suddenly of the 1950s, which is the worst possible moniker for these people. I can't ever believe, I can't believe they ever adopted it, but actually it makes sense because they didn't actually believe the same things that the people before the war believed. Frank Chodorov was, was top among them. Uh, they were libertarians, basically. They, they wanted to eliminate the state in every area. They were distrustful of war. They sang the praises of trade and commercial society. They were individualists, not collectivists. They had no interest in, 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 in you know, exotic uh, ideologies of control and imposition like, you know, th theocracy and, um, you know, imperialism and these sorts of things. That was not what they cared about. Uh, they were just pure individualists in, in the 19th century, 18th century Enlightenment uh, sense. But they were tough for, because they had lived through the 20th century, which is to say they lived through the um, dawn and development and uh, uh, advancement of the total state. So in a sense, they were, they were far more sophisticated thinkers than Jefferson or Thomas Paine or anybody in the 19th century, because they had seen it. You know, they had seen World War I. They had they'd lived through uh, the rise of the bureaucratic state, the permanent nation state, and, and its war-making welfare state and positions. And they had a greater uh, passion against the state as such, and less naivety about the prospect of, of cobbling together the perfect state. They understood it couldn't be done, that so long as you have a state, it's going to be impossible to control. 
and um, ultimately you have to root it out. You know, just root out anything what we call the the nation state. Now they did have various, you know, degrees of views on 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 how much uh, uh, you need some political forms to administer the the rule of law. Um, you know, they ranged in radicalism from somebody like Henry Hazlitt, who was a kind of a kind of an old constitutionalist, uh, to Mises, who was a um, you know kind of a, a laissez-faire radical. Um, to uh, Garrett Garrett, who's kind of a kind of an old old fashioned, uh, um, you know, nineteenth century style. Gil Gilday, celebrator of enterprise and entrepreneurship, was a little bit sympathetic to protectionism. You know, that was his his deviation. Um, Albert Jane Ock, who uh, was a Georgist and the closest thing we had to an anarchist. I'm, I'm pretty sure that. It would have been solid a solid thing to call a knock an anarchist. And I think in that same spirit, Frank Chodorov, uh can actually be re regarded as an anarchist uh, without being clever, without being underhanded or surreptitious or, or uh, dissembling in any sense. He basically makes an argument for for anarchism in this book. Um, uh, but whether you accept that argument or not is really uh, not relevant. He this is a book about uh, two things. Uh, one, it's about the state. What is it? What does it do? Uh, what are its uh, effects in the world? How come it comes about? Where does it come about? Where does it come from? Can it be limited? Um, what are its, what is its, its nature and its structure? And how is it different from the rest of the, uh, the rest of society? And here, this book just excels like nothing else. And the second thing this thing is, uh, this book is about is, is the celebration of commercial society and the non-state means. He wants to divide all activities in, in the social order between, on one hand, uh, production, on the other hand, predation, uh, which is, you know, pretty much the Franz Oppenheimer model. But it's a lot clearer than Franz I, By the way, Oppenheimer is great. I mean, you should not neglect Oppenheimer's amazing 19th century treatise called The State. Um, or its second iteration, Albert J. Knox, I guess, 1936. 637 book called um, Our Enemy of the State, which is a wonderful book and a big attack on the New Deal. And then the third great follow up, Frank Trotteros, The Rise and Fall of Society, Trotteros' last great work. As I said, this book was published in a world that no longer cared about libertarianism, no longer cared about individualism and, and that sort of pre World War II tradition. Um, but uh, that doesn't make any less great. It just means that you know the the the, the William F. Buckley crowd and you know the rise of and the and the Russell Kirk conservatism uh, had displaced it. You know, it, it, it's it's really remarkable when you when you think about the distance that separates somebody like Russell Kirk and Bill Buckley, whom I, I like, and actually I was you know, had s several friendly encounters with, with Buckley. I mean, he's just an un unbelievably charming man and, and way more laissez-faire oriented than the current generation of right-wingers. I mean, you know, these people uh, today are just, you know, just just uh, unbearable apologists for, for the likes of Donald Trump and so on. I mean, you just can't believe the kind of blather that's coming out of the mouths of these um, modern-day conservatives. Uh, but the idea that there's any relationship at all between somebody like Frank Chodorov and modern day conservatism is preposterous. I think he famously said, uh, if anybody calls me a conservative, uh, I'll give them a punch in the nose. <laughs> Violation of the non-aggression axiom there, right? But he, he hated conservatism and he couldn't stand the rise of these conservatives in, in the late 1940s and early 1950s that, you know, uh, all about watch fobs and, and uh, uh, you know, and cultural affectations, um, and uh, celebrating order above liberty, um, you know, neglecting the individualist tradition, uh, warm to the state, um, very worried about disrupting, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the 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 rules under which society lives. I mean, but, and of course, I need I, need I mention that a major major factor in the birth of modern conservatism after World War II was this burning passion to uh or to for re for for sustaining the the world war world war ii military industrial complex and um wedding 
um, anti-New re Deal resistance uh, movements with a new uh, love for the Cold War. So building nuclear weapons, arming against the Soviets, and so on. Um, you know, Bill Buckley said famously, we're going to have to tolerate a totalitarian bureaucracy uh, for the duration until we can get rid of the Soviet Union, since that's the great threat on the horizon. Of course, the Soviet Union went away, and the totalitarian bureaucracy is still with us, right? So the conservatives, the conservatives of this period were actually completely different um, from people like Trotteroff. And, and, and once, they, once they got their magazines, and you know, once Time magazine started heralding the glories of Russell Kirk and, and National Review uh, rose to prominence, and you know, people like Buckley you know, sort of swept, swept over um, American uh, popular culture as officially representing what was called the right. Um, I mean, think about the purges that began to take place. I mean, people like John T. Flynn um, was, you know, like Shadaroff, just, you know, lived, lived in obscurity um, throughout the 1950s, despite his, his, his astounding and brilliant literary output fighting the New Deal through the 1930s and uh, 20s, 30s and 40s, really, not the New Deal, but I mean, he was really writing great books in the 20s. The whole generation of these intellectuals is sort of just pushed aside uh, Trotoff was a similar situation. He hung around in New York literary circles. Um, you know, just nobody wanted to have anything to do with him. They just regarded him as a crabby old man who cares uh, left over from the past. Um, um, uh, I, I read one letter from Murray Rothbard. He was relating going to a cocktail party one time, and it's populated by all the new generation of, of extremely puffed up, self-important conservatives uh, centered around around Nash Review, and, and Murray just exploded in a, in a rage in this letter, I forget to whom he was writing it, and he just said, you know, these people are just not worth a damn, you know, these people, they're uh, intellectual lightweights and, and all show. Uh, none of them have anything to offer anybody, and none of them have anything that's really worth challenging other than, to, you know, tutting everybody for insufficient, uh, you know, piety and devotion to, uh, you know, uh, uh, re reactionary, you know, attitudes on every area, um, fake philosophy, and so on. He said the one exception in the room was the great Frank Trotteroff. So Murray immediately bonded with Frank, and they hung around a lot. And um, Murray was very seriously and mightily influenced uh, by Frank Trotteroff. Um, in fact, I think it's it's fair to say that Murray took his uh, his anarchism was was primarily influenced by Chodorov. There was a moment in his life when Murray went from being a supporter of limited government to being an, an anarchist, and and it was under the influence of of Frank Chodorov, both personal and literary. However, I don't think there's any evidence that Murray actually encountered this book. Um, not that he he needed to, uh, you know, um, this. But the the because there's there's so many other writings that that Trotoff did. You know, Trotoff was a very interesting guy. He was actually um, uh, his primary influence in life was was Henry George, who wrote Progress and Poverty. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know about Henry George, I wrote an essay about about Henry George's on Liberty Me. Um, after having read this book, this was uh, Progress and Poverty was the Atlas Shrugged of the late nineteenth century. It was the book that had a, a you know, just a, a, an, an awesome circulation, that, you know, sold millions of, of copies and had this enduring um, influence over the course of sort of like five decades. I mean, it's just unbelievable how influential that book really was. It was considered to be um, the treatise in favor of the possibility of human progress. Written in, the, written in the late 19th century, a book that celebrated trade, uh, believed in material progress, uh, believed in, in laissez-faire, and believed in uplifting all classes in, in society uh, through material advancement and the widest possible distribution of the means of production. Of course, everybody forgets uh, about all these points about Henry George because he was most famous for having pushed this, uh, the idea of the land tax, you know, which he, he regarded the land monopolies as, as the great inhibitor uh, to prosperity. But he was also, you know, and, and there, you know, I just don't even want to get into that issue. Uh, uh, but he was, he was also a, a, a mighty hater of the state, actually. I mean, he thought the state 
you know, working with the banks and land were the, the great source of monopoly in society. And um, wanted a laissez-faire society, you know, despised protectionism. And it was in this sense that Trotoff became like, m seriously influenced by the, the Georges. Now, ironically, he actually came to head uh, the Henry George School in New York, uh, which was kind of a big deal in his time. And he was the editor of its newsletter, which was called The Freeman, actually. So Chadaroff was actually an uh, editor of The Freeman. And most of you probably know that I, uh, in addition to my work with Liberty Me, I, I worked for the Foundation for Economic Education, which continues to, continues to be the publisher of The Freeman. So Chadaroff was actually an editor of The Freeman. I remember when Sheldon Richman came on board as the editor of The Freeman some years ago, he said, put out an announcement that his highest ambition was to be an editor somewhat like Frank Chodorov. Um, wow, that's a big, big ambition because Frank Chodorov is just awesome. You know, if you've never encountered his work before, um, you'll be just amazed at his clarity of thought, his humility of, of expression, uh, his, his brilliance. Uh, his, it's a little deceptive because he's, 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 he writes as a journalist. He was also editor of Human Events, which is wasn't always a warmongering Republican uh, proto-fascistic rag. Uh, it, was, it, 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 it actually was a laissez-faire publication before, uh, back in the day. I think I'm talking about, you know, 1940s and 1950s. It was a, it was a good, it was a, it was a wonderful publication. Um, Frank Chodorov also founded uh, the International Society of Individualists. Um, which by the 1960s or the 1970s changed its name to the Intercollegiate, uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute. So retaining ISI, but, re but replacing every single word. No longer individualist now, just Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Um, and uh, for the duration of the of the 1970s and 1980s, uh, one of the one of the big promoters of the Cold War, and and no surprise, you know, the works of, of of Russell Kirk, who, you know, again, I mean, Russell was a friend. Okay, you know, I, uh, we spent a lot of time together, but there's no question that this man, uh, you know, had an an immense influence in post-war on the post-war right to, to purge the liberal spirit. He was on the war path against liberalism, old liberalism, and particularly libertarianism. This is, this is what he hated more than anything else. So when ISI moved from being intercollegiate, uh, moved from being International Society of Individuals to Intercollegiate Studies Institute, I mean, there's a signal there, right? No more individualism, no more liberalism, no more libertarianism, no more uh, radical freedom, pro-freedom ideology. But, uh, incidentally, uh, when I saw the, the new head of uh, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute uh, recently, um, he, he pulled me aside and he said, you know, my number one ambition is to bring back that Chodorov spirit and to, and to restore ISI as the voice of, of uh, that Chodorov always wanted it to be, to become, in effect, the um, International Society of Individualists again. That pleases me very, very much. I mean, just just to hear it, whether it's possible, you know, I don't know, but it, it just it thrilled me to to hear that. Okay, so let's let's uh, dig into this book, uh, which, as I say, is extremely obscure in a way. Um, I had read all the works of Chodorov. Most of them had were have been available. And a lot of them had been reprinted um, in the 1970s and 1980s. They maintain a little bit of fame, and then most all of them went out of print by the by uh, the 21st century. Um, but this one, the rise and fall of society, uh, had very little uh, circulation, and I had never seen it cited, and I've never personally seen a book review of it that was contemporaneous, you know, with this publication. I mean, I just I don't. It's it just strikes me as the kind of book that that, that came out and and wasn't ever read. It's very interesting. It came it came out about the same time as um, Atlas Shrugged. Now, of course, Rand and Chodorov had very different political um, outlooks, 
but they shared this much in common. Uh, they were both completely purged from the National Review crowd, you know, and, and never ever made any headway um, uh, within that sort of Cold War uh, Buckley crowd. Uh, Buckley purged, you know, uh, Rand. I mean, she wasn't welcome to the National Review when they, they shredded her. They failed to find any any merit at all in her worldview, which is um, pretty weird considering just how you know, awesomely influ influential she's been over the last um, half century. But uh, but Chadoff was in the same situation, in the same boat as Rand or, 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 or Flannery, the rest of them. He just wasn't, wasn't welcome. So his book sort of came and went, which is a real tragedy. Um, so why is this book important, and why should, why is it good that that it's out here and available at Liberty Me? Well, I can't think of another book that, in such a concise and clear, beautiful, elegant way, makes all the core points as precisely as it does concerning economics and politics and their interrelationship on the development of the social order. I mean, I truly can't think of another one that's as clear and as mighty and as um, precise as this book is. Uh, I, I've, felt, I've, I've felt this for some years. Like when people ask me, uh, look, I'm interested in this whole libertarianism thing you're, you're, you're doing. You know, what book do you recommend? I, I just always come back to this one um, because I, th I, think it's, I think it's the best. I mean, it's an interesting book that it, it never founded a movement, right? I mean, you, you look at something like Carl Hess's um, uh, book on the end of politics, or, or monograph on the end of politics that came out in 1969. You know, that was in many ways like a founding document of, of the new libertarianism, uh, or, uh, uh, you, you know, for a new liberty that came out uh, three years later with the founding, founding of the Libertarian Party. Uh, so you have to go way back, you know, um, 15 years uh, to discover a book like this. Um, but it speaks less of contemporary issues. I mean, most of the libertarianism of the 1970s was dealing with sort of issue-based stuff, like, you know, what should we do about the environment? You know, what what do we think uh, about uh, uh, the, the Cold War? Um, uh, you know, Murray Rothbard's uh, For New Liberty was actually in many ways a kind of a, a founding template for the type of work that Cato Institute is doing. It's not, it's not to say it didn't deal with fundamentals, but it's it's mostly just dealt with with very specific use cases and how liberty could solve social problems in a way that uh, that uh, this uh, government cannot. Um, but this book is is dealing more with principles um, throughout. Uh, all the way from the very beginning. I'd, I'd like to read some of it uh, to you. Um, and he puts the fine point on it, and the, and the point is this. I mean, it's, it's actually a fascinating thing. Um, why is it that in all of our discussion of politics and economics today in, the, in public life, is there so little talk about what the state is, uh, what is its nature, how, what makes it different from the rest of society, and what should it do, if anything? I mean, these are these are fundamental questions. They're the questions that, you know, I, I, how can you even talk about politics without asking them? And yet, they're never asked. I was fantasizing today about you know some possible you know, about this scenario. You had a, a candidate's debate. You know, take this primary debate that are going on in the Republican Party, and to just ask each of them or one of them or somebody, you know. Uh, Ted Cruz, what is your view of the state and society? What do you think it should do? Or just ask the question. I mean, wouldn't you be curious what they would say? I mean, what about Carly Fiorina? What about uh, Donald Trump? What does he believe? What does he believe about, say, with Jeb Bush? You know, what, are they, what do they think the state should do? What, what's his primary job? What's its ancillary uh, uh, role. Uh, there's always a shortage of resources. What do they think is the essential function of the state? I don't know. I've never, I've never in my lifetime heard a political candidate for office ask that question by anybody. I mean, Reagan sort of addressed it from time to time, uh, but for the most part, people don't ask that kind of question. Um, 
they'll sometimes answer it in speeches. I mean, Barack Obama has, has put his mind to that task from time to time. But for the most part, we don't have that kind of discussion. And I think one of the reasons we don't have that discussion is that the entire media class and the opinion molding elite is kind of dedicated to driving the question out because the question itself presumes a kind of demarcation between the state as an institution and the rest of society. And that's the great insight that libertarianism provides that is otherwise avoided by practically everybody. Nobody really wants to talk about the state as a different kind of institution. You know, everybody is obsessed with, is with presenting the state as being an extension of, 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 of the rest of the social orders, an expression of our values as a, a realization of um, you know, national aspirations, as, as a helper to us all. Uh, you know, or as I forget who said it, that you know, the, the state is just simply what we do together, you know. So there's, there's a kind of a, a shabbiness, or you could say it as a conspiracy, you know, to, to cl clearly delineate the difference between the state and everything else. And, and so what is that difference? Well, it's pretty simple, actually, if you think about it this way. The state lives by predation, and everything else lives by production, with the exception of the criminal class. And even they can't get away with it because their criminality is generally against the law and frowned upon by everybody else. But the state um, can engage in the exact same behaviors, uh, constantly aggression against a person and property, uh, presuming the right uh, to tell us what to do, tell us how to behave, what to think, what to say, surveil us, rob us, loot us, pillage us. Um, and it can do this under the cover of law. So it's the one institution in society it's able to do to us what we're not permitted to do to each other without getting in trouble or at least feeling bad about it or having other people feel bad that we're doing it, you know? I mean, that's what makes the state different. Um, or, or another way to put a more fine, a finer point on it is that the state is, the, is exogenous to society in the sense that it's the one institution that absolutely obeys a different law from everybody else. All the laws that you and I have to adhere to, the state does not have to adhere to, as you know, just from watching the way cops drive around town, you know, they don't have to adhere to the law. They don't have to obey the speed of them, so they don't have to obey any laws. I mean, they do whatever they want. But that's true for the whole of the state. You know, that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it different. That's what makes it unique. And that's a rather extraordinary fact, I think. Um, you know, to, to think about, you, you think that would be something notable, something to actually consider before we talk about any kind of programs, any kind of new laws. Oh, wait a minute. Are we just increasing the role of legalized violence and pillaging in society? I mean, isn't, and isn't that a problem? And if we're going to do that, shouldn't we actually carefully consider that and consider that the means used by the state are actually um, egregious and uncivilized? or at least radically different from the way that you and I engage with each other and behave with each other, you'd think that would be a relevant consideration. But there's a, there's a kind of a weird uh, pretending that everybody does, you know, uh, uh, that as if the state is not some separate institution that obeys a separate law that doesn't have to be held to the moral standards of the rest of us. And you can see this in our language and the way we use language. You know, <laughs> people talk about, should we go to war against Syria? You know, should, should we have invaded Ar Iraq? Um, should we try to keep out um, more Chinese products? Should we permit Argentinian beef? Um, should we have a system uh, of uh, mandatory ret retirement? You know, and this, this sort of plural pronoun we use, you know, we, and, and we all fall into this, right? I mean, I, I think I probably write this all the time. I, I sort of try not to unless it's just deliberate. Um, but we talk about what the state does is something that we are doing, uh, which, if you think about it, is preposterous. It's not. Well, you could say, well, okay, we vote for these things, but, you know, and I'll get to that because actually um, Chodorov addresses this point in, in here uh, brilliantly. Um, so this is a problem. I mean, it's, 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 it's not rigorous. It's not 
correct. It's not scientific. It's not truthful. Uh, the state is not the same thing as the rest of society. It lives off a different means, and it, 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 it has different tools at its disposal. It obeys a different law. And it uh, goes about its actions in a way that uh, if, if you and I did it, it would be considered completely immoral and egregious and wrong. So it becomes extremely important to actually speak about the state as a distinct thing. And if you do that, you will have, and if you learn that that's true, you will know more than probably anything else you'll learn from, the, from ever, any, any uh, a book on political science you're gonna read in college, or in, or in literature class, in sociology class, or in psychology, or even in economics. Um, uh, people do not speak about the state uh, with any degree of honesty or clarity. Uh, it, it's everybody pretends like almost like it doesn't exist, that it's just merely an ex, a, a public expression of our of our will as a people, you know. So, I mean, if the book does nothing else to to make this point and hammer this point home, um, it it will change your life in that sense. Now, as I'm talking, I'm probably talking mostly to libertarians. You already know all this stuff. But, you know, there was a time when you didn't know this. In fact, there was a time when you didn't know there existed such a thing as a state at all. And I don't remember when you, if you, how well you remember the loss of your innocence when you first, first discovered that there's a ruling class out there that pretends that, um, that, that, that claims the right to rule you and, to, and steal your stuff. But it's an alarming discovery, actually. You know, were born into this world thinking of... Um, our uh, parents as the authorities and other adults and maybe teachers and that sort of thing, and that the whole world around us is, is, is all that really exists. Then at some point, you know, you discover, oh, there's um, a million bureaucrats uh, many, many miles away who actually are in charge of your life and they can pass any laws they want and do anything they want to. It's, a, it's an amazing and, and shocking, alarming discovery, right? And then uh, having discovered that, then, you know, you know, following that, we're, we're constantly told that, you know, don't worry about it. Actually, these people are wonderful. They're actually benevolent and brilliant and, and beautiful, and you owe them a lot. I mean, we wouldn't look at all the things we wouldn't have were it not for the state, you know. So, um, yeah, they exist, but really it's, 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 it's all in your own interest. That's an expression of your, of your own values, and we as a community have created this thing for ourselves, you know. So, so just chill. Uh, don't be paranoid. Don't be whacked, whacked out about this whole, whole problem and, and stop stop worrying about it, you know? Well, this is where this book comes in very, very handy. Um, I, I can't think of another book I'd rather give, you know, like a sophomore in college, you know, as an assigned reading or uh, maybe as a parent, you know, just, just, just something to, uh, uh, to tutor uh, a, a, a child to, and sort of create a little bit of an immune system to the kind of baloney they're going to be getting in all their classes on this topic or that they're going to read on the internet. Um, you can read every issue of Slate and BuzzFeed and Salon and everything else and never get an honest and truthful discussion of the subject. So let me just read some of this stuff because I think it's really very powerful. Um, Maybe I should just start with the very beginning because I think this may be um, it's really good. I'll, I'll start on page two. Economics is not politics. One is a science concerned with the immutable and constant laws of nature that determine the production and distribution of wealth. And the other is the art of ruling. One is amoral and the other is moral. Economic laws are self-operating and carry their own sanctions as do natural laws, while politics deals with man-made and man-manipulated conventions. As a science, economics seeks understandings of invariable principles. Politics is ephemeral, its subject matter being the day-to-day -day relations of associated men. Economics, like chemistry, has nothing to do with politics. The intrusion of politics into the field of economics is simply evidence, simply an evidence of human ignorance or arrogance, and is as fatuous as an attempt to control the rise and fall of tides. 
Since the beginning of political institutions, there have been attempts to fix wages, control prices, and create capital, all resulting in failure. And such undertakings must fail because the only competence of politics is in compelling men to do what they do not want to do or to refrain from doing what they are inclined to do. And the laws of economics do not come within that scope. They're impervious to coercion. Wages and prices and capital accumulation have laws of their own, laws which are beyond the purview of the policeman. It's very nice. The imperviousness of economic law to political law is shown in this historic fact. In the long run, every state collapses, frequently disappears altogether, and becomes an archaeological curio. Every collapse of which we have sufficient evidence was preceded by the same course of events. The state, in its insatiable lust for power, increasingly intensified its encroachments on the economy of the nation, causing a consequent decline of interest in production until at long last the subsistence level was reached and not enough above that was produced to maintain the state in the condition to which it had become accustomed. It was not economically able to meet the strain of some immediate circumstance like war and succumbed. Preceding that event, the economy of society on which state power rests had deteriorated. And with that deterioration came a letdown in moral and cultural values. Men did not care. That is, society collapsed and drew the state down with it. There's no way for the state to avoid this consequence, except of course, to abandon its intervention in the economic life of people it controls, which its, no, its inherent avarice for power will not let it do. And there's no way for politics to protect itself from politics. It's not beautiful. It's absolutely fantastic. Okay. I'm going to have to plug in my uh, machine here real quickly. Excuse me one second. As long as these things last, they still don't last forever. Uh, okay. Now there's a chapter in here about, um, there's two chapters in here that I just want to kind of focus on. One is called The Humanity of Trade, and I love this chapter. In fact, you know, I was, as I was reading it today, I thought, I have to get this thing in print and put it on the, on the, on the website of the Foundation for Economic Education, just as a standalone chapter. And then I realized, just with a quick search, that it was already up there. And of course, like a lot of things, it hasn't been well read, as far as I can tell. So um, it's just a beautiful chapter and one of the, one of the greatest uh, uh, tributes ever to the beauty uh, of the exchange economy. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, when you're, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but, you know, I feel like I keep trying to write this chapter again and again, and I feel like I'm coming up with something new. And I've worked really hard at my brain, I'm like, thinking and realizing, oh, this is great. I, I'm going to treat trade as a civilizing institution. And any step away from trade is, is a sort of uncivilizing and, and, and contributing to the brutality of of, um, of of public life, and I've tried to come up with examples. And it's just pretty weird to suddenly you know read a chapter like this and realize Frank Chatter. I've said this all before, and much more beautifully than I've ever managed to do it. You know, no matter how much I try. So I I, I would like to just read you some of this, just because I think it's just so awesome. Whenever two boys swap tops for mob marbles, that is the marketplace. The simple barter in terms of human happiness is no different from a trade transaction involving banking operations, insurance, ships, railroads, wholesale and retail establishments. For in any case, the effect and purpose of trade is to make up for a lack of satisfactions. The boy with a pocket full of marbles is handicapped in the enjoyment of life by its lack of tops, while the other is simply discomforted by his need for marbles, and both have a better time of it after the swap. The, the greatest lesson in economics ever given. I mean, if you get that, you know, you, you know, you know, eighty percent of what you need to know. In like manner, the Detroit worker who has helped to pile up a huge heap of automobiles in the warehouse is none better off for his efforts until the product has been shipped to Brazil in exchange for his morning cup of coffee. 
Isn't that just beautiful writing? Isn't this guy great? I hope this is, hope my reading this is inspiring you to go out and just download the book and just enjoy it. Trade is nothing but the release of what one has in abundance to obtain some other thing one wants. It is as pertinent for the buyer to say thank you as it is for the seller. That's another essay I wrote. A big, I wrote a big essay about this. I thought it was my insight. You know, I've come to find out. You know, trotter off, nailed it. You know. 50 years ago, 60 years ago. The marketplace is not necessarily a specific site, although every trade must take place somewhere. It is more exactly a system of channeling goods or services from one worker to another, from fabricator to consumer, from where a superfluity exists to one where there is need. It is a method devised by man in his pursuit of happiness to diffuse satisfactions and operating only by the human instinct of value. Its function is only to transfer ownership from one person to another, but also to direct, it's not only that, but it's also to direct the current of human exertion. For the price indicator on the chart of the marketplace registers the desires of people and the intensity of these desires so that other people looking to their own profit may know best how to employ themselves. Living without trade may be possible, but it would hardly be living. At best, it would be mere existence. Until the marketplace appears, men are reduced to getting by with what they find in nature in the way of food and raiment, nothing more. But the will to live is not merely a craving for existence. It is rather an urge to reach out in all directions for a fuller enjoyment of life. And it is by trade that this inner drive achieves some measure of fulfillment. The greater the volume and fluidity of marketplace transactions, the higher the wage level of society. And insofar as things and services make for happiness, the higher the wage level, the greater the fund of happiness. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. It is not only that trading <clears throat> in itself necessitates some understanding of the customs of the people one trades with, but that the cargoes have a way of arousing curiosity as to their source, and the ships laden with goods are followed with others carrying explorers of ideas. The open port is a magnet for the curious. So, the tendency of trade is to break down the narrowness of provincialism, to liquidate the mistrust of ignorance. Society then, in its most comprehensive sense, includes all who, for the improvement of their several circumstances, engage in trade with one another. And its ideation character tends towards a blend of heterogeneous cultures of the traders. The market place unifies society. Okay, I'm gonna blast forward. Just as trade brings people together, now, as I read this section, just think about all the conflicts that exist in society today, where there's a conflict between uh, you know, men and women or blacks and whites or immigrants and uh, citizens, uh, the able and disabled, you know, the language barriers, you name it. You know, the, our society is just rife with conflicts and they seem to be weirdly getting worse, or at least there's plenty of political figures out there trying to make them worse. Listen to what Charoff says about that. Just as trade brings people together, tending to minimize cultural differences and make for mutual understanding, so do impediments to trade have the opposite effect. If the customer is always right, it is easier to assume there's something wrong with the non-buyer. The faults of those who refuse to do business with us are accentuated, not only by our loss, but also by the sting of personal affront. Should the boy with the tops refuse to trade with the boy who has marbles, they can no longer play together. And this desocialization can easily stir up an argument over the rel relative demerits of their dogs or, or parents. <laughs> That's beautiful. Just so, for all our protestations of good neighborliness, the Argentinian has doubts about our intentions when we bolt our commercial doors against him. Compelled to look elsewhere for more substantial friendship, he's inclined to think less of our national character and culture. 
The byproduct of trade isolationism is the feeling that the outsider is a different kind of person and therefore inferior, with whom social contact is, least, is at least undesirable, if not dangerous. To what extent the segregation, the segregation of, of people by trade restrictions is the cause of war is a moot question. There could, there could be no doubt that such restrictions are irritants, that they can give other causes for war more plausibility. It makes no sense to attack a good customer, one who buys as much of our products as, as he can use and pays his bills regularly. Perhaps the removable trade restrictions throughout the world would do more for the cause of universal peace than any political unions of people separated by trade barriers. Indeed, can there be a viable political union while these trade barriers exist? And if freedom of trade were a universal practice, would a political union even be necessary? Well, wow, that's just that's just awesome quotation. I just I have to, I just marked it because I'm going to try to remember to quote that. I'm just going to move on here because I'm running out of town time. Um, Yes, if we base our thinking on the natural urge of the individual to better his circumstances and widen his horizon, operating always under the law of parsimony, the most gain for the least effort, we are compelled to the conclusion that effort which does not add to the abundance of the marketplace is useless effort. Society thrives on trade simply because trade makes specialization possible and specialization increases output and increased output reduces the cost and twelfths for the satisfactions men live by. That being so, the marketplace is the most humane institution. That's nice, huh? Nice. Okay, I've got a, a section here I want to also draw your attention to. This is um, uh, the chapter 12. In some ways, I think one of the most extraordinary chapters in the book because um, I'll tell you why I think this because it's one of the one of the most truth telling sections I've ever read about the structure of the state. You know, and forgive me if I've been through this before because um, I'm I'm so struck by it. You know, in these debates and the way we elect politicians and everything else, we there seems to be an operating assumption on the part of uh, the bourgeoisie, you know, uh, a part on the part of the sort of ignorant masses, that the people we elect constitute the state, that they are the state. And this is one of the great uh, myths, right? Um, mostly what these politicians specialize in is getting elected to public office. That's what they're good at. They're not good at anything else. Uh, they're not really good at legislation. Certainly they, they don't do the enforcement. Um, uh, they're not actually the state. Um, there's a whole apparatus of the state that lives outside of them and it's a permanent structure that essentially has nothing to do with, um, with the political class. In fact, the political class has very little control and it's not just in our system, it's, it's, in, it's, it's in all systems. Uh, it was true in the Soviet Union. I mean, the, the, the premier, the president, you know, the, uh, the head of the Soviet Communist Party, who, who ruled, uh, 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 Brezhnev is a you know, great example of that, and you can, you can think of all these, um, all these guys that ruled um, after the Stalinist era were actually extremely frustrated by the bureaucracy. There's nothing they ever wanted. They couldn't even get their, they couldn't get their way. Um, state managers are, are rarely as powerful as, um, as, as under normal conditions as, as people think that they are. They, they just simply aren't. I mean, there are conditions under which that does happen. And, you know, I've, I've written a lot about Donald Trump and, and people have asked me, do you think there's actually a chance that he could, he could become the American dictator? And I, I think there's very little chance of that actually, um, mainly because I don't think we have a big enough crisis in, in uh, American life today to, to cause people to reach out for a dictator on that level. But there are conditions under which that could happen. But for the most part, in the normal course of the running of affairs of democracy, the elected politicians are mostly for public consumption, entertainment value. Uh, they see their job as uh, getting reelected and for paying back the favors in office to those who paid for them to get elected in the first place. Uh, and which is about which Trump is exactly right. I mean, Trump actually has said this, and it's one of the most shocking things I've heard in, <laughs> from any presidential candidate everywhere. He actually said this. It's no wonder people are drawn to it to some extent, actually laying out the truth like that. But what, the fact is we're ruled by bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy is ruled by law. And the law is mostly passed by dead people 
long ago expired, left office. But that's the way the system works. We're ruled by the, by the dead, uh, by living people carrying out the edicts of dead men. Um, that's the actual structure of the state. And he, he, he details this very beautifully here. How am I doing on time? I'm fine. I have time to read a little bit more. When we reduce the abstraction political power to its operational reality, to the way it actually works, we see how it feeds on reform. Every proposal to improve man's lot by political measures calls for the enactment of a law or an official edict. The law presupposes that some people are not doing what they ought to do or are doing something they ought not to be done. Hence, the purpose of the law is to regulate human behavior. It was not just beautiful. It was a beautiful prose. The very premise of the law is a violation or evasion that will ensue from its enactment, that it will not be self-enforcing. Therefore, the heart of the law is the punishment clause. No law is worth the papers printed on without such clause, and no law has any effect unless it is implemented with a core of enforcers. Therein lies the secret of accumulation and, perpe and perpetuation of political power. Where authority is diffused and highly formalized, as in this country, the, the, the arbitrament of force is resorted to only when subtler methods of suasion and bribery have been exhausted, methods that require the services of highly trained officers currently known as bureaucrats. The bureaucrats are people, not unlike like the people whose direction is entrusted to the care under the law. They too are bent on getting the most out of life with a minimum of exertion, and they too adjust their thinking to the means at hand. They develop an occupational frame of mind, a bureaucratic psychology. It is sui generis, 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 I guess people say generous, or it becomes so, so after a period of inurement. The mind of the bureaucrat can be compared, and without invidious intent, with the criminal mind, in that it takes its shape from the peculiarities of the trade. Like the criminal, the bureaucrat is removed from the disciplines of the marketplace, gaining his living not by production, but by predation. There the similarity ends because the trade of the bureaucrat is legalized and does not suffer from social disapproval. In fact, um, because the bureaucrat is presumed to be a civil servant, his trade acquires an aura that neither the thief nor the producer can hope for. This <laughs> is beautiful, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm intrigued by this section, man, because the libertarians of this time and before and really after have rarely actually examined the state and this level of, of with this level of uh, insight, um, which you get as a lot of rhetoric about how bad the state is, but an actual examiner of the structure of it and how it works uh, is actually very difficult to find in libertarian literature. Um, the Marxists are very good at discussing this. What the state is, and 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 uh, and what how, you know how its edicts are passed, and how it's enforced, and where it comes, you know, just the dynamics of of the decision making. Why does the state get up in the morning? You know, libertarians haven't usually talked about that, so this is why this is such a rare uh, passage. The bureaucrat likes his job. The emoluments may or may not be as great as what the marketplace would pay for such real services he may be able to render to, to society, but the kudos which he has heaped on those who exercise and represent or have access to power is importance. His ego pay is not to be, be despised, but his job depends on law, not on production, and therefore his primary concern is in the law, its enactment, its perpetuation, its enlargement. The more the law, the better which is another way of saying that his mind is keenly attuned to the possibilities of reform. That's why we have to have reform, to have ever more laws, right? The proliferation of reforms means the proliferation of bureaucratic jobs with the corresponding abundance and, uh, and honorifics and opportunities for the ambitious. Thus, a vested interest in reform appears, developing both a class-conscious distinct distinctness and the skills necessary to its prepar perpetuation and advancement. The bureaucracy is an aristocracy of office. It is vital to this aristocracy that offices once established be perpetuated, even though the occasion that brought them into being is long past, and those which cannot be kept alive are replaced by others. The vested interest sees to it that the power of the state does not diminish. Isn't that fascinating? Strictly speaking, laws are made by monarchs and legislatures. It was Pharaoh who proclaimed the law, not Joseph, but it was in the advice of Joseph that Pharaoh acted. 
In our democratic era, when parliaments make laws, it is the bureaucrat who phases them. This is the critical thing, who phases them, uh, uh, who phrases them, who prepares the supporting arguments which legislators mouth, who uh, estimates or underestimates the cost of the operations, who sets up <coughs> the machinery of jobs to implement the laws. And when a law and operation does not affect the solution of the problem it was supposed to solve but produces problems of its own, it is the bureaucracy that comes up with the correctives. Think of Obamacare. Ideologically, the bureaucracy is always leftist, if you mean by that term, term the enlargement of state power, and Chudoff didn't actually uh, accept that definition, but he's using common left parlance of the time. Not so much by persuasion, but because of a personal interest in the psychology of the trade. A bureaucrat is a socialist or a communist, really, because his business requires him to think like one. Once a law enters the statute books, and I know I'm running out of time, but I just have to read you this. Once a law enters the statute books, it is beyond the purview of those who made it, the legislators or the king, and becomes the special private province of those who operate it. The more numerous and prolix the laws, the more important and more self-sufficient are the operating specialists. No part-time legislature, legislator, whose principal concern is getting elected or king, preoccupied with enjoyment or president or whatever, can possibly make his way through the labyrinth of law without a guide. Thus, the real governing body of a country that is, a, is of the country is its practicing bureaucracy, whose prospects brighten with each reform that becomes law. And that's it. That's the way it works. It's the bureaucracy that's ruling us, not the, not the politicians. The politicians that depend fundamentally on every aspect of what they do, especially the, the, the game that they continue to play on an entrenched class. Um, we're more recently, we're starting to call this the deep state. I think that's a very nice um, way to think of it. And of course, uh, you know, I mean, as Chodoff further points out, it's not as if the bureaucracy operates independently on its own. The bureaucracy is uh, very often works hand in glove with uh, the ruling class in, in private industry, so-called private industry, whether it's the Treasury Department and the large bond dealers, or the Department of Labor with the labor unions, or the Consumer Product Safety Commission with the largest manufacturers in America, or um, uh, the Department of Health and Human, Human Services with insurance companies in the medical profession, uh, the Pentagon with the uh, armaments industry, uh, housing and urban development with uh, large-scale uh, urban uh, developers and real estate uh, industries, and so on. The purpose of the state, and the, uh, by which I mean the bureaucratic class, is to serve the ruling class in the private sector, and, and that's the way it works. It's a, a gigantic uh, racket. And once you understand this, you understand more about the state than... Uh, 99.99% of the rest of the population. So, um, yeah, I'm just giving you a slight look, a hint of what's in this book. I think it's it's absolutely magnificent. Uh, and again, what makes this book different from all the other libertarian books on the state that I've seen um, is that he goes into this kind of detail of how it actually works. So it doesn't just whip you up in a frenzy against the state, which he does, and that's very valuable. But he takes that next step and helps you understand it, helps you get to know the enemy uh, a lot better. He closes out the book with a reflection on whether or not there's any hope. And, and typical Trotteroff, I mean, he was not uh, a despairing person, despite his sort of apparently, you know, sort of personally crabby way. And of course, he was an old man at this, at this point. But he ends it by saying, I just want to read you this because I don't want to get it wrong, actually. This last last chapter called One Can Always Hope, and he talks about the breakdown of the state and how inevitable it is and how so much of society um, is about the things that, that persist beyond, uh, beyond the state. Um, he doesn't believe there's any control in the state, though he favors any attempt to, to do so, and, um, but is very skeptical of top-down political reform because he understands what a scam it is. His last sentence is... Um, the really beautiful one, because he, he's actually very optimistic about the long-term hope for freedom. But he thinks it comes about because people in their own lives decide to make the decision to, to, um, to, to be free, to be non-compliant and to find ways around it and to, to live a good life and to innovate and to trade and to build beautiful things despite the state, despite all of the things that stand in their way. 
So his last sentence is the is the the brilliant one, the one I hope to leave you with here tonight. He says, "The will to freedom comes before freedom itself." So let's let's uh, let's, let's revisit Trotov, celebrate his memory, um, uh, be grateful for this marvelous book that he's read. Download it and pass it on to your friends, please, because I, I I I do believe this is the single best tutorial in economics and politics that I've ever read personally, just overall. And it ends on a, on a hopeful note that we can actually escape uh, the loss of civilization. We can escape, escape the decline and be wasted by um, you know, a ruling class that operates under a different law from the rest of us. But we can only do this by having a passionate desire to be free and to finding ways in our own life to live that freedom uh, in whatever way you feel called to do. By being a member of Liberty.me, you've taken the first steps. Uh, stay engaged in the community, help others, let others help you, and let's uh, let's, let's build a, a, a the basis for a free society in the future together. We can do this. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, and I look forward to seeing you next week. All the best. <laughs>